2001, what a year it was for professional wrestling. The entire landscape changed dramatically between January and December, and now at long last, the World Wrestling Federation is finally the last company left standing. So let us celebrate by crowning the first ever undisputed champion at the first ever Vengeance pay-per-view from December 9th, 2001 at the San Diego Sports Arena in San Diego, California. The show was nominated by Gustav Peterson Sandquist, Tyler Bowles, Daniel Howell, Steven Slater 007, Alan Jolly, and Sam Adelaide over on patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. 10,800 people in attendance here, about 315,000 pay-per-view buys. Your commentary team back together again, Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler. The King returned to the announced desk. The Raw After Survivor Series after Paul Heyman was banished to the Shadow Realm for a bit. This opening hype package for this pay-per-view is one of the most bonkers I've ever seen. Scene. It's kind of a running thing we've seen in, in pay-per-view hype packages for the last year or so. These short films by someone named Freddie Fellini. This one is called One, and it has Freddie Blassie watching old wrestling. Well, a bunch of weird shit's happening in the background. There's a spaceman, there's a clown, a woman dancing in a tattered dress. And hey, let's splice in footage of Ivan Koloff and Sting and Lex Luger and Hulk Hogan. What is even happening? Something worth pointing out here that sledgehammer imagery is all over the show, and Triple H was even on the poster, but there's no Triple H here just yet. Apparently there were plans initially for him to come back on Vengeance as kind of his return show, but he was not quite fully rehabbed from his quad injury he suffered earlier in the year, so it was held back a little bit to his return for the Royal Rumble the following month. We have a rare promo to begin the pay-per-view as Mr. McMahon opens the show. He's still recovering from last week on SmackDown when he got the stink face from a returning Rikishi. Of course, that was the big blow-off to what began the day after Survivor Series with the beginning of the Vincent Man Kiss My Ass Club. The famous scene saw William Regal become the first person to do it, and all month Vince was on a tear, wanting people to kiss his ass in a very forceful manner. He did it to Jim Ross the following week. He wanted Austin and The Rock and Trish Stratus to do it, so he finally got his comeuppance on the go-home SmackDown when he was forced to kiss The Rock's ass, so The Rock was really humiliating and toying with Vince the whole time. He teased his ass was going to be kissed, then Jim Ross's ass, then Trish Stratus's ass, and then in the end it was finally Rikishi, who like I said, was finally back on TV. He had a shoulder injury and was gone for the entire invasion. Well, here at Vengeance, Vince telling the people not to laugh at the misfortune of billionaires, which feels like a very familiar sentiment we're still hearing 20 years later. He wraps up his promo by saying, he who laughs last, laughs the loudest. And then out comes the 50-50 owner of the World Wrestling Federation, talking about Ric Flair. He made his return to the company on the Raw After Survivor series. The story is he purchased Shane and Stephanie's stock in the Federation then they used that money to buy WCW and ECW respectively. So Flair's got 50% stock and ownership. So he and Vince now constantly try to one-up each other in matchmaking is the story here. So Flair shows up, tells Vince to shut up, and let's start the show with this tag team match here as Albert and Scotty Too Hotty take on Test and the European champion Christian. Scotty and Test had been beefing since the previous month of Survivor Series when Test beat up Scotty to take his place in the Immunity Battle Royal, which he'd go on to win. In. Albert, who was Intercontinental Champion at one point this year, it's important to remember, is now teaming with Scotty and is called the Hip Hop Hippo. And it's crazy to think that up until recently, when Scott Taylor requested his release from NXT, he and Albert were still working together up until just this year, working together in NXT. It's crazy how wrestling works sometimes. Also, still loving Christian as European Champion. It's kind of a spin on D'Lo's gimmick for a time when he kind of claimed the sudden adoption of all things European. He could speak fluent European. It was really hilarious stuff. One of my favorite runs of his here. And these two are part of a new faction that kind of formed out of the ashes of the Alliance after Survivor Series. So it's these two, it's William Regal and the Dudley Boys. They're all chummy with each other lately. They got to keep their jobs after Survivor Series because they were either all champions, won a battle royal, or kissed a man's butt on live television. They're the heel group dominating the mid card and making the four main event guys in the show look good for the last several weeks. Scotty starts out hot but gets cut off and the heels begin their beatdown. Jerry Lawler on commentary offering up some team name ideas for Scotty and Bert, the Honkadelics, MC Crackers, Run BMW, and the Pasty Boys. We get it, they're white. Albert gets the hot tag, does some hippin' and hoppin' and bippin' and boppin' as he gets his shit in, goes to the Baldo bomb, but Test pulls him out of the ring. Christian wants to go for the worm, but he gets cut off. A really fun sequence with all four guys that ends with Albert hitting the Euro champion with the Baldo bomb for the win. 
I give it two and a half stars out of five. I thought it was a solid opener, and like I mentioned, that ending sequence was fun, if a bit fleeting. I thought it was kind of disappointing to see Tess, because you've heard me talk about him at length in these reviews lately. For this to be, I thought I kind of wished he was in a better spot right after the invasion blow off. Then again, I do appreciate them kind of continuing the storyline and having some uh, creating a program out of that beatdown that Tess gave Scotty at Survivor Series. The coach is backstage with Willie Riggs. He questions Regal's methods as of late, but Regal says they're not questionable, they're successful. He says that Edge has incurred his wrath, and when that happens, he's better off selling his soul to the devil. Nice promo. We go now to the Intercontinental Championship match as Regal challenges Edge. Edge got in Regal's business the last couple of weeks, which led to this match. Also, Regal has now incorporated the power of the punch, aka the brass knuckles, into his repertoire. He was gifted the knuckles by Vince shortly after Survivor Series, and now he's been using it in matches to great success. Edge is off to a good start. Regal cuts him off on the outside. Regal really laid it in on Edge with the knees and the European uppercut, another big knee lift off the ropes. Edge blocks an attack, hits a swinging neck breaker, and begins to make a comeback. Nice Hurricane Rana off the top by Edge. Edge launching Regal out over the ropes by his legs. Haven't seen that done before. Goes for a spear but runs right into some steps instead. As the referee checks on him, Regal pulls out the brass knuckles hidden in the ring. Regal hits three tiger bombs in this match. Two of them in a row and Edge kicks out of all of them. Regal pulls out the Nux but walks right into the spear for the win. Edge retains. I give it three stars out of five. I like both the people in this matchup but I thought this performance was not either of their best work in the last several months. I did enjoy though the physicality and the story with the brass knuckles at the end. Speaking of which, the brass knuckles of course would go on to be a big component of Regal's gimmick for the rest of his time as a wrestler and beyond. You'd see when he was the GM of NXT T. He always saw the brass knucks placed on a nice little like vel velvet pedestal on his desk. So it's kind of fun to see the very humble beginnings of the brass knuckle component being brought in here. Co-owner Ric Flair is chatting backstage on the phone when Kurt Angle shows up. He calls Flair a 14-time world champion. Whoops. He tries to talk Flair down and insists that he's going to win it all tonight. And Flair's just like, yeah, man, that's cool. Like, good for you. Good luck. I believe in you. Kurt's trying to get Flair all riled up, but it's not working. Either that or Kurt's trying to convince himself of what's going to happen but it's not working. I think it's really funny in this scene. A rare moment in which Ric Flair plays the straight man to somebody else. Elsewhere, Lita's warming up in her referee shirt when Matt Hardy shows up. Matt acknowledges it's been hard on all of them lately, but he'll finally get to show everyone why he's the better Hardy, which of course is the most important thing here. Lita warns Matt even though they're dating and in a relationship, she has to remain objective. Matt says the two of them are going to celebrate big tonight after he wins. And we go to that match now, brother versus brother. The first breakup feud, first of all, would be several down the line for the Hardy Boys as Matt takes on Jeff. We've been seeing this whole thing play out for several months at this point. It's kind of sad because we just saw Edge and Christian break up earlier in the year and the Hardy Boys so soon after. Matt's being a rude a-hole. He's been overbearing in the partnership with he and Jeff. This beef between them goes back to them being little kids. Lita gets caught in the middle and she's had enough of this nonsense but Matt tells her to referee their match. In real life, according to their autobiography, Exist to Inspire, Jeff is starting to go through you know, his, his initial downward spiral here. He's becoming a lot more distant. He's been showing up late to events. He apparently no-showed an event in the build-up to this. And so, you know, he's not at his best point here. And I'm thinking, oh, that explains the hat. The match begins with some basic stuff, the arm wrenches and takeovers. Matt takes over, and the fans seem pretty disinterested here. Matt goes to the second rope leg drop and misses. Jeff comes back, hits his own leg drop. Lita helps Jeff out of a tree of woe, which Matt does take exception to. Matt goes for a sunset flip powerbomb to the outside, but Jeff counters into a hurricane rana. Jeff seems to hurt himself flipping back into the ring, but Matt shows no mercy, goes after the leg, gets Jeff in the half crab, but there's a rope break. Matt gets thrown outside. Jeff is too hurt to capitalize, though. There's a double down. Matt wants it the twist of fate, but Jeff counters. Matt tries to cheat to win, but Lita won't allow it. Matt gets distracted and almost costs him. Moments later, Matt wants to go for a super twist of fate, but Jeff throws him off the top, hits the swanton. The cover, Matt gets his foot on the ropes, but Lita misses it, counts the three anyway, and Jeff wins. I give this one two stars out of five. The match was not terrible, but it was not great, befitting, you know, these two guys and the styles that I think fans were more accustomed to seeing with them. I think, you know, I 
was expecting something a little more flashy, a little more fast paced. We didn't really get that here. We saw some small slivers of it. And it makes you wonder, were they saving it for some potential rematch down the line? But no, I just don't think it worked well. And also, more importantly, the fans did not want to see these two fight each other. They didn't want to see the Hardys break up. And so I think that was reflected in the reactions to this matchup. They didn't want to see these guys fight and they reacted accordingly. And, you know, not surprisingly, these two would be brought back together as a team like within well, a week. January basically is when they're a team again. Backstage, women's champion Trish Stratus shows up to The Rock's dressing room. She gives him a peck on the cheek for good luck. Then The Rock beckons her back and says, after their big title matches tonight, there will be plenty of time for Trish to smell what The Rock's cooking. Ooh, she looks intrigued. Man, what a year Trish Stratus had in 2001. She, you know, started off the year as Mr. McMahon's mistress, and then she was teasing something with Jeff Hardy before she got hurt. She comes back and she wins the women's championship, and now they're doing this relationship with her and The Rock, which back then and now, I just like, I watch it and I, there's no chemistry. I do not feel anything when I see these two, you know, big stars you know, interacting with each other. It's like, it doesn't make sense. They don't seem to like, they're both the, they're the top male and female stars of the company at this point, but seeing them together on screen and doing the romance thing, it just doesn't click with me. It's very like Hollywood in that sense, or it's like these actors you're supposed to believe have this chemistry, but I just don't see it or feel it. Well, up next is a match that felt like it kind of came out of thin air in the last week or so. It's for the Tag Team Championships as the Dudleys defend against Kane and The Big Show, who beat the Hardys in a number one contenders match that Matt had asked for despite Jeff being hurt. You know what's interesting is that Undertaker turned heel the week after Survivor Series, which we'll get to in a little bit, but I don't think Kane ever once addresses his brother's change of heart or anything because, you know, these guys were a pretty solid tag team in the months during the invasion angle, and, you know, anyone want to ask Kane what he thinks about Taker's new quest for respect? Nope, mum's the word apparently. The big guys throw their weight around at the start of the match. Both Dudleys are taken outside. Kane dives onto them from up top. Stacy Keebler makes a fuss about it, so Big Show finds it to be a good time to pants her, then give her a big spanking. Boy, talk about something that has not aged well. Ref gets distracted, which allows for a what's up on Kane. Big Show gets the hot tag and is all over Bubba and Devon. Goes for the choke slam, but takes a chop block. Kane goes up top, but he takes out his own partner on accident. Then Big Show returns the favor moments later. An exposed turnbuckle shows dropped face first onto a kind of like a 3D. The Dudleys win and retain the gold. This one gets two stars out of five for me. It felt like kind of a blah tag match. I mean, the Dudleys bumped their asses off for Kane and the Big Show and made them look amazing, so I'll give them credit for that. But that's about all this match had going for it to me. It just felt like it was kind of a placeholder match for all four guys and also just kind of beef up this pay-per-view. Backstage, Lita apologizes to Matt for her mistake earlier, but Matt's having none of it. Only go to the Hardcore Championship match as Rob Van Dam defends against The Undertaker. So that was the big story from a week after Survivor Series with The Undertaker finally turned heel because Vincent Mann was trying to get Jim Ross to join the Kiss My Ass Club and you had Taker making the save supposedly. Talks about all the different wrestlers who'd come and gone before him like you know Hogan and Shawn and Brett and all these different guys who'd kissed Vince's ass, but Taker had kissed Vince's ass the most. And so he asked JR, were you going to kiss his ass? And he goes, hell no. And Taker goes, does that mean you think you're better than me? And so this whole story now is Taker not getting the respect he feels he has earned after a decade plus of destruction. And so you also know the heel turn is official now because Taker has cut his hair. He's got the short look now. And honestly, I like heel Undertaker at this point. I, I immediately like his character and his persona a lot more than I did during the invasion because I railed a lot of Taker's performance during that storyline with a, a bunch of people, and I'll get to that in my kind of invasion roundup at the end of this. So what a difference a heel turn makes for Taker, because for me, it justifies my dislike for his character, and I think it just, it just comes off better. And of course, now with this great reset after the alliance is gone, you need some people to be realigned as heels. And so Taker, I think he'd kind of gotten the most he could have out of the babyface biker run. So it felt about time for a heel Taker run here. Van Dam catching Taker off guard at First, the quickness, big senton off the top rope. Fight on the outside, the action spills into the crowd. RVD goes for a dive, but Taker just sidesteps him. Taker grabs a fan's Mexican flag and uses it to choke out Van Dam, which gets a big reaction from the fans there. Van Dam's thrown over a barricade, which then falls on his face. The brawl continues by the stage area. Taker grabs a chair, but Van Dam blinds him with a fire extinguisher. Van Dam climbs up the stairs, dives off onto Taker, and then onto a bag of flour, apparently. Back up on the stage, Taker's back 
can control. He lawn darts RVD into the set, goes for the last ride, but RVD grabs a hold of something and gets away for a moment. Rolling Thunder on the steel, then a running drop kick with the chair. They're fighting near the edge of the stage. RVD goes to the Van Daminator, Taker ducks it, the choke slam off the stage and through some tables and debris. The cover, the win, and the new champion. This was a match unlike I think anything RVD had experienced so far in his time in the company, and it was a big test for him to this big pay-per-view match, high profile with Taker, who he wrestled before on TV and had beaten, but this one felt a lot different because of the, the, the face and heel dynamic, obviously. Taker took a lot more from Van Damme here than I felt he had taken from anyone else in the alliance combined uh, before this point, so it was pretty refreshing to see. I think these styles meshed really well for each other, and it was a solid match. Ric Flair is on the phone again. Now he's cut off by Chris Jericho. He says he can see that Ric Flair does not have the confidence in him to win it all tonight. Flair again being diplomatic and saying Chris to go for it, but Chris says it's not a matter of if, but when, and says that when he wins, he's going to get Flair to hand him something he's never had, the undisputed title. On we go now to the women's championship match as Trish Stratus defends against Jacqueline. Oh look, another women's title match with zero build, because as far as I can recall from watching the shows leading up to this, Trish and Jackie never once interacted in the build to this pay-per-view, because Trish had spent all month when she wasn't kissing the rock, she was feuding with Stacey Keebler in a Gravy Bowl match and a Braun Panties match, and Jackie was barely even on TV until the go-home Smackdown when she beat Crash Holly in a match. I feel bad for the two ladies here, especially Jackie, because she's given the task of having a straight-up wrestling match with the relatively green Trish, making her look good, teaching her, and we get a We Want Puppies chant from the crowd about a minute in. There's some happy feet to start things off, but then Jackie slows things down and takes control. Jackie sweeps the leg, but it looks bad for both ladies. Some miscommunication on the roll-up out of the corner looks like a video game glitch. Jackie blocks the stratisfaction and levels Trish as Jerry can't stop commenting on the color of Trish's bra. Trish ends up winning the match with a backslide and retains. I give it a half star out of five. It was not a great match. There were a lot of missteps throughout and also it was a very short match. And also Jerry Lawler's commentary did not help. I was pining for a Paul Heyman return pretty strongly as this match was going on. And at least after this match we can go into it and walk away from it thinking, well, hey, you know, Trish does get better over time. We get a recap of Vince getting his face shoved from Rikishi's ass. The big quiche is reporting live from WWF New York and says he's back and ready to back that ass up again. On we go now to the main event portion of this pay per view. Now, as we saw after Survivor Series, WCW is no more and therefore no more reason for a WCW championship. So it's renamed the world title and it's going to be absorbed here in this unification series of matches. It's four men, three matches, two titles, and one undisputed champion. These series of matches were made by Flair and McMahon working together to create this main event. Most of the build, though, has revolved around the Kiss My Ass Club. Sigh. The very introduction of the matches themselves gets pyro, which I liked a lot. The commentary treated like a huge deal, as it should be, you know, the WWF championship, and even though it's not, like, controlled by the original WCW, that championship still has a lot of history and lineage to it, so it is very important. The top two American world titles being unified here is a big deal, and you know, even though we've seen a couple of good matches throughout the show up to this point, I feel this is the first time that we actually are watching an honest-to-God, like, big pay-per-view. Your first championship match sees Stone Cold Steve Austin defend the WWF Championship against Kurt Angle. Lots of history with these two in the last year, mostly one-sided though. Some good back and forth to start things out. Austin starts working over Angle's arm. The fight goes in and out of the ring. Angle slamming Austin's leg into the ring post. Nice figure four around the post as well. Angle on the attack with suplexes. Three Germans in a row. Goes for his moonsault, but alas, he misses. Austin begins to make a comeback. Hits a spine buster. Even hits some Germans of his own. Two more than Angle did. Kurt with a low blow. Hits the Angle slam. There's a kick out. Kurt's frustrated here. Goes for his own stunner, but Austin gets out of it. Hits his own stunner and wins to retain the title and go on to the finals. I give us one three and a half stars out of five. The match was, it was fine. It was okay befitting these two guys, but they'd done it better in matches they'd done earlier in the year, I think. Nothing we really hadn't seen before with this one. And also, I just feel bad for Kurt Angle. And we'll talk about this more in my Invasion Roundup. Just the fact that this is the same guy who survived three stunners in a match earlier this year, and now he's taken down by one stunner from Austin in a match that wasn't nearly as good as that one. So yeah, again, kind of what happened to the badass that we saw just as recently as like two months before this. 
King and JR seem to be killing time before we get a backstage segment of Test barging in on Trish Stratus. She's responding to this a lot differently than she did when Hugh Morris and Chavo Guerrero barged in in Manchester. Test saw how she kissed the rock and now it's his turn. Pucker up, baby. Trish wants none of this and Test dares her to try and get him fired because of course he is immune, which he reminds you of for several months after this. On we go now to the WCW Championship match as The Rock defends once again against Chris Jericho. Now since Survivor Series, Jericho has gone full-blown heel and now he's gotten really full of himself. He calls himself the living legend, which did briefly get him and the company in Larry Zbysko's legal crosshairs. He's dyed part of his hair red. The commentary calls him an egomaniac and an egoholic every other sentence. So needless to say, they're definitely pushing Jericho full-blown as the heel that they really restrained doing with him during the invasion itself. But now that that's over with, anything goes. The match starts at a quicker pace than the last one. Jericho knocks Rock on the outside with his triangle drop kick. Some fighting at ringside. Back in the ring, Jericho with a top rope spinning elbow even tries the cocky pin. I think I ever beat somebody once with that in revenge. Jericho wears down the Rock, gets him in a sleeper. The Rock fights out of it, but Jericho stops him. Hits the lion salt, but the Rock kicks out. Jericho getting into it with referee Hebner, who takes no guff. Fighting on the top rope. Jericho hits a top rope crossbody, but Rock rolls through, gets a near fall. Jericho runs into the corner, goes flying into the ring post and tumbles to the floor. He recovers and catapults the Rock into the post. He wants to hit the Rock with his own bottom. That didn't come out quite right. A Rock bottom attempt countered into a DDT by the Rock through the announce table. Jericho counters another Rock bottom into the breakdown. We get a double down from there. Jericho's back up and wants to do the people's elbow. The Rock stops him, goes to the sharpshooter, but Jericho reverses into one of his own. The Rock is passing out from the pain briefly before he wakes up, gets the rope break. Rock with the him bottom, but he can't capitalize. Vince McMahon enters the chat. He distracts the referee. The Rock decks him. Vince goes flying. The spine buster, people's elbow attempt, brings Vince in, finishes the elbow, beats up Vince some more, but then Jericho with a low blow, the Rock bottom. Jericho wins and regains the world championship. I give this one four stars out of five. This match, I felt very similar vibes to the match they had at No Mercy for the championship that Jericho also won. Great story here, great intensity. As good as Angle, Austin, that feud was for a lot of their run in 2001, I think Jericho's and Rock's near the tail end of the year, he really picked up steam near the end of it. And I think this is another great example of that. Jericho has zero time to recover as Stone Cold shows up, still limping from earlier, but ready to fight for the undisputed title. But then Kurt Angle dinks Austin with the chair, but then Rock with another him bottom onto Jericho. So now it's even. The undisputed championship match begins with a double down. Jericho is up first and is on the attack, but Austin comes out of the corner with a spear and fights back. Fight goes to the outside. Austin starts peeling back the padding on the concrete floor. Onto the Spanish announce table now. Jericho blocks a stunner, goes for the walls, but Austin throws him off. Back in the ring, Austin takes a shoulder to the post. Jericho with one of his thousand and four moves. Arm bar! Now with rope assist. Jericho goes up top but gets picked off on his way down. Jericho rolls to the spine buster attempt into the walls. Jericho goes for his flying forearm and Earl Hebner takes all that. It sounds like there is some mild Triple H chance in the crowd here. Keep dreaming. Here comes Mr. McMahon again with referee Nick Patrick. Ric Flair stops him and we get the Patrick flop. McMahon sucker punches Flair, throws him into the post. Austin sees Vince, beats him up a little bit. Austin makes a big comeback, catches Jericho's missile dropkick into the Austin Crab. Jericho's tapping out, but there's no referee. Booker T runs in and decks Austin in the back of the head with the WWF title. He doesn't work here. Hebner back in, the cover, the count, and the three. Chris Jericho is the first ever undisputed champion, and Mr. McMahon laughs and laughs and laughs as an irritated Austin is covered in confetti and we fade to black. I give this one four stars out of five. Now I will say it is unfortunate that the historic nature of the merging of these two titles is bogged down so much by just screwy stuff, especially in those last two matches. It is par for the course during this time, but you feel bad at the fact they had to go there for that one. They couldn't keep it a little more sanctified, you know, having not so much interference here. But I mean, again, it's just, it's the way the stories are built. That being said, I have to give Austin and Jericho big props, especially Jericho for working two matches in a row. And with 
Jericho's case, absolutely no rest in between. Of course, it is an historic moment, so I gotta give them credit for that. And as someone who was a massive Chris Jericho fan, especially at the time, I think is very cool and very validating to see him get that moment in the spotlight. You know, not just the secondary championship, like it was kind of perceived the world title was at the time, uh, but the whole enchilada, being the person to have beaten Austin and The Rock in the same night, a line that he would repeat ad nauseum for several years, but it is a very huge accomplishment. Even though this championship reign itself did not, it was not his best of his career, of his several world titles, this was the one that kind of changed his career forever, more so than the WCW title win earlier in the year. My grade for the final show of the Invasion storyline arc, looking at back 20 years later, Vengeance 01 is a B minus. I think the historical significance of those last three matches, the whole main event portion for the Undisputed title, and the quality of those matches puts this one in the upper grade category for me. But the undercard, for the most part, is pretty uninspired. You know, not a lot of terrible matches on this show, but you know, and the, but the ones we saw in the undercard, with a couple of exceptions, with the RV. D and Taker, and maybe to a lesser extent, Regal and Edge, just, you know, not truly great, just kind of like in the middle. It just seems like so much of the big storytelling devices went away when the invasion was over and the alliance lost that you have a lot of characters kind of floating in the ether. A lot of the matches we saw built up for this thing had like no build, in fact, or very little, and so not a lot of reason to get behind a lot of the undercard in this thing. But again, the importance of those last three matches and the unifying of the belt, I think, was a big deal. I think it was very clever, the fact that they were able to kind of swerve the audience here because the entire build for this show, whether they wanted to admit it or not, was like Rock Austin. That's what we are kind of wanting to see in the finals. Everyone wants to see Rock and Austin, but they don't give you that here. So you get Jericho instead kind of like stealing the thunder of people. Again, that getting that big heel character over that he was really starting to develop. I think that was well done. And again, as a Jericho fan, you know, it's a big moment for me. So that's why I put the grade up a little bit higher here and give it a B minus. And so ends the Invasion storyline 20 years later. It's been really crazy to kind of watch all this programming back from like May of 01 to the end of the year and just seeing how much changed in the company and in the wrestling landscape in that time period. And to watch it back again, having watched it the first time as it was happening, and to see it again 20 years later with refreshed eyes and to be able to cover it for this channel has been a lot of fun for me and really helps fill in a lot of the gaps that I had in earlier videos videos I'd done about the invasion. So after having looked back extensively at this product from 20 years ago, it's now time for some final comments on the Invasion storyline. Things I liked, things I didn't like, things where my appreciation changed for the better after re-watching it, and vice versa. I will say, watching all this stuff again made me really turn around and change my opinion on Stone Cold Steve Austin's heel turn. Like, again, the timing of it is really not great when you consider like where the landscape of the wrestling was at that time and where people were coming and going, but as the paranoid, crazy leader of the Alliance, I think his stuff was gold. I think he had the ability to hit that switch from being a really funny, entertaining heel champion to a really devious and just despicable one, kind of shades of what he was doing earlier in the year right after his heel turn. His effortless move back to babyface after Survivor Series is something I still take issue with and don't like because uh, there was no accountability for what he did. But in the moment, during the Alliance storyline, I think Austin as the leader was actually a lot better than I gave it credit for originally. The things I liked the most about the Invasion storyline often had had so little to do with the actual like fake war between the WWF and like WCW ECW like a lot of individual character things I appreciated and enjoyed a lot like the hurricane for example quite possibly the most enduring thing to have come out of the invasion angle was Shane Helms totally reinventing his gimmick becoming this cheesy superhero and it just totally getting over instantly and it was so entertaining and so funny I just love that stuff then there was Edge and Christian's breakup and each man's ascent into the singles ranks Austin and Kurt Angle had a great feud, but if you stripped all the Alliance and Invasion stuff away from it, it would have almost been the exact same. It would have held up just fine on its own without the whole Invasion thing surrounding it. Chris Jericho's rise to the main event was also something that was very interesting about this time period, but again, the war against the Alliance had so little to do with it. It was all an inter-WWF war, and honestly, it would have made a lot more sense if, say, Chris Jericho joined the Alliance and Christian didn't, but neither had to. Honestly, the 
invasion was really underplayed for a lot of this time and just diluted the meaning to everything and the justification as to why so many of these wrestlers were here. Obviously, you had that overarching, oh, they're in the Alliance, but then like by the end, so many of those connections within the Alliance were so tenuous that it's like it just really was irrelevant by the end. Paul Heyman's time on commentary as the mouthpiece of the Alliance led to some brilliant back and forth with Jim Ross. Those two had one of the greatest short runs on commentary of all time, no question. And as I've mentioned before on this review series, I really liked the ascension of Kurt Angle as a top guy in the World Wrestling Federation here. I love the comedy stuff he and Austin did early in the Invasion's run, but for all the Invasion did to help build Angle up, it was just as responsible in tearing him down. And a lot of it had to do with that double turn, joining the Alliance and then joining the WWF as like the double agent, the mole or whatever. I guess I should clarify something I've said in the last couple of reviews here in the Invasion. It's not that I don't think Kurt Angle's turns didn't make sense, which I had been saying. I guess what I really mean is I don't like the turns. For what I mentioned earlier, like they tried, it just really undid all this work to make Kurt this legitimate badass and to get away from the goofy comedy stuff. And it just felt like a tumbling back into this thing, which like, yeah, it worked for a time, but he had evolved so much as a character. I think that hurt him more than anything. Also the fact, speaking of things that hurt him, this completely one-sided feud with Austin, even though he was briefly world champion here, he never truly got a leg up on Steve Austin. And I think that really, in the long run, kind of like short-circuited a lot of his trajectory into making him like a, the top guy or a top guy. Speaking of someone who got criminally hurt in all this was Taz. Now you could argue in the grand scheme of things, Taz was slowly transitioning out of wrestling with all his mounting injuries, doing more commentary stuff, fine, but even within all that, his was still a very compelling story in the Alliance angle. There were a handful of times when Alliance members like threatened to defect or like they could defect, join the WWF, and that would have really meant something. And of all those moments, I think Taz himself had like three or four of those moments because there were so many times where it's like he was getting berated and getting beaten down and everything. You saw the frustration. And the only time he finally develops a backbone and really gets his heat back is when he beats up Paul Heyman on the Go Home Smack down and then he's treated like a jobber in the battle royal he comes back to the wwf because like oh vince likes what i did to paul Heyman cole and that sort of thing and he's a broadcaster now but like there were so many chances you could have had throughout the entire storyline with a big variety of people to have these these very pivotal or emotionally like proper like good mm, yeah kind of defections like with taz like with rvd and they just didn't do it and i think that would have shaken up the angle and made the invasion storyline mean so much more it wouldn't have had to be a whole lot, just a little bit of things here and there, not just like Tori Wilson defecting because she's dating Tajiri. I'm not saying anything new when I say there was a lot of money left on the table with the Alliance storyline, the invasion angle, I should say. And of course, people have written think pieces and have done videos rebooking the invasion for a very long time, far better than I ever could here. So if you want to hear some great fantasy booking about the invasion 20 years later, go check them out. I'm at least on one or two of those things, so you'll see me there in some capacity. You know, like any storyline or era, the Invasion had a lot of strengths, had a lot of weaknesses. As a standard like WWF storyline, like here are some wrestlers, here's a story we've kind of built a framework around, it was fine. It was passable. But the big thing here is that everyone has said is that with something with this much like hope and scope and scale and heat behind it as a feud between the World Wrestling Federation and the WCW and to a lesser extent ECW, I guess, all there's a whole lot of stuff from that angle was squandered. Even if you didn't get the bigger names that were on the holdouts of the contracts, who you could argue their presence may not have even improved the invasion storyline. Even if you got those guys, so much stuff was squandered with what they had, which could have been something, you know? The real kicker is, only a month or two later, so much of this storyline is completely forgotten about and never referenced again. When you get right down to it, much like 2020, 2001 is kind of just like a forgotten year in wrestling where there's so much that, you know, it's significant and it's, it's noteworthy in its own way, but also is more or less completely forgettable because a lot of that stuff is totally retconned and never referenced again. And those are my final thoughts on the invasion on Vengeance 01. What did you think of the story arc looking back 20 years later? Let me know in the comment section below. What kind of story arcs from other periods in wrestling do you want to see me cover from all the classic pay-per-views that have been nominated over the years? It's a huge list, so if you send me a story arc, chances are I've got all the shows or most of the shows that have been nominated that I can cover them at a future time. Uh, we'll be covering at least one or two other story arcs like over the course of the next year, but all is based on your 
your feedback and what you guys want to see me do in the months to come. But next time on the Classic Review, the last video I'll be doing for the year 2021 is a very special review. Look back at AWA Super Clash 3. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.